Well, good afternoon. Hello and welcome to this conversation on trade flows in the age of automation hosted by the Atlantic Council. I'm Josh Lipsky. I'm the director of the Geoeconomic Center here at the Council. And I want to thank our partners at the British Embassy for all of their collaboration on this event and our work that supports what we're doing today. Now, the reality, as we know, is that COVID-19 has made the focus on the resilience of supply chains even more incredible than it's been before. Uh, but we've been working on this issue for years, and we're going to continue to work on this issue. And today's event is going to put a spotlight on the technology aspect, on blockchain, on AI, on the Internet of Things, and how all of this is going to change trade and services in the decade ahead. And we think that component, trade and services, is so critical because this is the fastest increasing part of global trade. We know this. We know it's growing 60% faster than trade in goods. WTO estimates this is going to make up a third of all trade by 2040. And frankly, a lot of those estimates come pre-COVID or during COVID. And we just know by the way we live our lives and what we're seeing in real time, how quickly this is evolving. Now, our research and it's being launched today, it's part of an Atlanta Council report and it supports this event we're doing, really explains this in depth. And we're going to share it in the chat and you can find it on our website. And I want to thank Jack Daly and Nick Brown and Bart Ostervelt and Ole Moore for all the work that was done in this research and in this paper. And I hope everyone has a chance to explore it. And again, as I said, you'll find it on your screens and we'll talk about it during the event. Now, one of the findings of that research that's so critical for this event is that the US and the UK are poised to benefit from the growth in trade of services. All advanced economies are, but the US and the UK in particular. And they can do it really by establishing rules for global trade, transparency standards, a way of operating and cooperating differently than has been done before. But it's gonna require plurilateral agreements, bilateral agreements, WTO reform. It's gonna require leadership. It's gonna require recognizing that global trade has changed and it means adapting quickly to meet that moment. And if we do that, if we adapt quickly, we can reap the benefits. And if we don't, the reality is that other countries that move faster will. So those are really the stakes and that's the purpose of this conversation and why we're here today. And I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Sabrina Rodriguez from Politico, who's going to moderate today's conversation. Now, Sabrina is Politico's trade reporter. She's done fantastic work over the past few years covering USMCA and all the trade developments, both in the US and around the world. And I know she's moving on to a more domestic political coverage beat. So we're very grateful to have her doing this in the trade component. And I think as she will acknowledge, and we all know, for better or worse, politics and trade are interconnected. So I think her experience and mastery of the trade beat will help her in her new pursuit. And we're thankful to have her here today. So Sabrina, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, it's, as you say, I, I think the trade beat and covering this for the past three years will serve me well covering politics. Um, and it's really exciting to be with you all. This is sort of my last hurrah on the trade beat for a little bit, um, although I foresee myself covering trade as it deals with the um, campaign trail. Uh, so yeah, so I, I want to get started, say thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I feel like these events always go best when people really get to ask lots of questions. I don't want to be the only one speaking and the only one asking questions. So feel free to, you have the Q&A function, uh, make sure to ask questions throughout the event and we can jump into them and I'll pass them along uh, as they come in and they rolled in, uh, especially as we head towards the end of the event. Uh, so I'm going to do brief introductions before everyone kind of does their opening statements. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I wanna welcome Anthony Philipson, uh, British Consul General in New York and Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for North America. Philipson was announced as Trade Commissioner for North America in 2018 and Council General in New York in November, 2017. Uh, as Trade Commissioner for North America, he oversees all the work for the department for international trade in North America, which is a busy portfolio these days. Um, and, you know, including growing the overall bilateral trade and investment relationship, improving market access for British companies and developing finance and trade policy. So we have plenty to discuss on that front. Um, I also wanna introduce Barbara Matthews, a non-resident senior fellow for the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomics Center. She's an accomplished global and transatlantic regulatory policy expert with significant experience in the public and private sectors. She served in various senior US government positions uh, in Washington and Brussels, such as 
Senior Counsel for International Issues at the House Financial Services Committee and First Treasury Department attache to the EU with the US uh, Senate confirmed diplomatic rank of Minister Counsel within the Department of State. I hope I got the titles right. Um, I also wanna introduce Rain Newton Smith, the Confederation of British Industries Chief Economist, where she leads a team that produces economic analysis uh, and prestigious surveys. Previously, Newton Smith was the head of emerging markets at Oxford Economics, where she managed a large team of economists and served as the lead expert on China, which we also know is a huge subject these days. Um, and then I want to last introduce Bart Osterveld, a uh, non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. Um, also, you will see that he's one of the uh, co-authors of the report that you should all definitely check out. Uh, it was a very interesting late night read for me yesterday. <laughs> um, Bart was is an independent advisor to companies and governments in the areas of macroeconomics, credit and country risk. He was director of the Global Business and Economics Program at the Atlantic Council until last December. And prior to that, he worked at Moody's Investors Service for almost two decades. Uh, I hope I got all your bios right. They're very long and extensive. Uh, <laughs> so I tried to pick some of the highlights out of there. And yeah, and I wanna turn it over to Consul General Philipson uh, for some brief opening remarks and we'll go one by one uh, to kind of get those statements out. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sabrina. Uh, it's fantastic. And uh, it's great to be with you all. And thank you very much indeed to, uh, to Bart Ostervelt and his team at the Atlantic Council, also Jack Daly uh, at Duke for producing this report. Uh, it's been a fabulous partnership with, uh, with the embassy and we're, we're hugely grateful. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about it with Bart himself, as well as with Barbara and Rain. Um, really always a pleasure to do events with uh, CBI uh, because it's so much about creating business and economic opportunity. Um, so let me just say a few words about why we were uh, keen to see this report produced and, uh, and why we're so excited about uh, what we can do with it. Um, I mean, as you say, my role here in North America is I work with our trade and investment teams. We are looking to uh, create opportunities for British companies in the trade and investment space. But I think also we're looking to engage in a more a broader strategic discussion about the future of the global economy, the future role the UK will play in the global economy, not only in partnership with the US and Canada, but also uh, or bilaterally between the UK and US, UK and Canada, but also in partnership with them in a, in a global context. Um, and I rather sort of simplistically boil down what I think we're all here to do into three categories, which is what do we want to do in the countries that we're in? What do we want the UK to look like? Uh, where well, there's a very strong narrative, I think, around being an innovation nation, tech-focused, services-oriented, which, uh, as, as Josh said, is just an accelerating dynamic in the global economy. Uh, and then the third piece is what do we want the world we live in to look like and uh, the role of technology in creating the world that we want to live in, uh, addressing some of the big global challenges, including on the global health side, the environment side, uh, you know, the role of technology in that is just fundamental. Um, so we need to think about, you know, how do we shape and create uh, that world? Um, technology, of course, is disrupting, creating, transforming whole sectors um, at an incredibly uh, fast pace. Uh, we need to try and understand what those opportunities are emerging from that uh, from that transformative dy dynamic. Uh, but also, uh, we as policymakers, uh, we need to think about the necessary policy and regulatory structures uh, to maximise the opportunity of technology and innovation in our economies. Uh, but also, if I'm candid, in order to address other dynamics, such as consumer safety, uh, the opinions of consumers and, uh, and citizens within our societies, uh, and as I say, the impact of technology on quality of life uh, and the environment. And um, when you're dealing with the complexities and uncertainties of issues uh, with an intrinsically transactional nature, such as emerging tech, uh, the, the, abs the absence of cooperation, the absence of structures and standards can, uh, in my view, undermine the effectiveness. Uh, both of those domestic regulations undermine trust in those regulations uh, and their enforcement. A lot of these questions, they're not actually new in and of themselves. I think we've been wrestling with them for, for millennia in some way in terms of how you, you get the right balance between sort of governance and innovation. Um, but I would say that what we're seeing now uh, is happening at a pace that we have not seen. Uh, and as we're seeing it sort of morph into different parts of the economy, uh, it's posing new questions that I think we need to ask ourselves. Do we have the right organizations, the right structures? Are we having the right dialogues uh, to address them? In some cases, of course, I would say that COVID has accelerated uh, some of these dynamics and trends uh, within our economy. But I would also very much say that technology is going to be absolutely key 
uh, to the recovery and renewal phase uh, of our economies uh, on the other side of the crisis. Uh, and all of that, of course, happening while we don't forget about some of the other huge uh, global challenges we faced, including certainly for the UK, uh, very focused on the climate crisis as we uh, build up towards the COP summit, uh, the climate summit in Glasgow uh, next November. Should have been this November, but we've had to slip it. So, you know, the UK has huge ambitions uh, in this space. Um, we have done a few things over the last few years I just want to highlight to try and shape the dialogue and the dynamic. Um, we published in uh, 2017 something that we call an industrial strategy. It's an explicit partnership between the public sector, private sector uh, and academia. It looked at four grand challenges uh, within our economy, uh, AI and the data economy, the future of mobility, the challenge of an aging society uh, and clean growth. On the back of that, we published a series of sector deals. One of them was in AI, uh, which was an almost £1 billion sort of contribution from the three partners, public sector, private sector, academia, to each other uh, to try and shape how we wanted AI uh, to be created within our economy and managed, including through things like the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. We also set out an ambition to attract 2.4% of GDP uh, into R&D, combination of public sector and private sector partnership. Uh, but again, we have to think about where are we going to find that research, uh, that, uh, that investment in our, in our R&D, and how do we attract it into the country uh, through some of the themes set out in the report of AI, blockchain, the Internet of Things, and advanced manufacturing. We, of course, here in the, U in the US, are very focused on delivering some of this through the free trade agreement negotiations that we're conducting uh, with the US Trade Representative's office. The uh, fourth round of those is wrapping up today. We've had almost 130 sessions uh, across the four rounds. Uh, and a lot of contact uh, in between. We are making good progress, and I think that will be a really important contribution uh, to some of the standard setting uh, work that we will want to do in this area. But it's not the only thing we're doing. We're also uh, continuing with a financial services regulatory working group that was launched by the UK and US Treasuries in March 2018. And we then need to identify where do we conduct the conversations that are gonna cover the other policy recommendations that have come out of this report and indeed other conversations uh, that we have again going back to josh's point that we need to do this nationally bilaterally plurilaterally multilaterally uh, the wto i think it needs to update its rule book that's one of the reasons why we're running a candidate for dg of the wto uh, we want to restart the talks around the trade and services agreement build on what we did in the internet in the uh, uh, information technology agreement pick up on the plurilateral discussions around e-commerce and then identify where we're going to have the other conversations around the big topics like ai and blockchain Myself, I'm not entirely sure that the WTO is necessarily the, the only place we can do this. We need to do it in the OECD, which of course, will, in our view, needs to address some of the other challenges, uh, including one that is a point of contention between us and the US at the minute around digital services taxes. It's all about, in my view, identifying the conversations that need to happen to address the problems which we have identified and then resolve them in collaboration with our global partners to free up that economic opportunity and those flows of trade and investment. I'm very happy to dig into some of these other issues uh, as we go into questions, but I'll just highlight two other big uh, issues for us. One is access to talent. Uh, we are developing a new immigration framework as we leave the EU or complete leaving the EU, fundamental to addressing the Prime Minister's ambition that we will be able to attract the best and the brightest uh, in the innovation sectors to come and invest and work and create uh, in the United Kingdom and use that as a base uh, to do business with the rest of the world. We're also very focused on uh, equality uh, within the economy. We do a lot of work here in New York around what we call STEM the gap, boosting female participation in the education sectors that, that are so important for the future, but also addressing some of the incredibly, just incredible low figures about uh, the ability of female founders to attract VC investment. Um, you know, if we don't do anything consciously to address the pay gap or the VC funding gap, I think the, uh, the figure shared will take 240 years uh, to address. We're not going to wait that long. We can't wait that long. So agenda, that's why I think it's so important to have this report as a contribution to understanding that agenda and then creating uh, those conversations with the private sector, with academia, with think tanks like the Atlantic Council uh, as we go forward. So let me pause there. Really looking forward to the comments from the other panellists, questions from the audience, and to continue the discussion going forward. Thank you very much indeed. And now we turn it over to Barbara. Thank you very much. And first, let me thank the Atlantic Council and BART for your leadership in spearheading this important contribution to the trade policy discussion. 
The report advances the ball significantly, in my view, by taking a hard look at the challenges that AI and the digital economy are creating for the multilateral system that was founded really in the aftermath of World War II. Let me also commend in particular the first table in the report. It provides an excellent analytical foundation for all of the pressure points at the intersection of AI and trade policy issues. Highly recommend uh, taking a really hard look at that. And while the report presents many interesting and intriguing issues, I really want to focus on one that hit home to me, and that's the standards component. The report makes the case that the first best way to address the difficult issues in AI and trade policy is to work really hard to generate cross-border standards at the multilateral level, many people this, and, and the bilateral level and the plurilateral level. Many people in the trade paradigm like to assume that it's a one-lane activity and one must choose one over the other. The reality is this is a multidimensional landscape that requires multidimensional engagement. The intersection of services, and particularly IT services and standards, is hardly new. As Anthony mentioned, policymakers and trade negotiators have been grappling with these issues for decades with painfully slow progress, painfully slow traction. As uh, Ambassador Tony Wayne and I described in a series of blog posts for the New Atlanticist you know, two years ago, I mean, this is a perennial topic, sadly for all of us. Why is it perennial? Because these are not easy issues. And adding AI to the mix amid a fast global pivot to a digital economy amid a pandemic is not going to be easy, which is why this report is so important. Standards issues are hard to address for a reason. They hit at the crucial question of who gets to make the rules. And in a representative democracy, the answer to this question is easy. Most of our Listeners who live in representative democracies don't really struggle with this. You know, we elect leaders to make decisions. They appoint technical experts who sort out the regulatory details on our behalf. But the international system is not a democracy. And in addition, the international system includes some sovereigns that do not share commitments to representative democracy. So their path towards rules may cut corners that other electorates may find objectionable. And even among democracies, the standards debate is fraught with challenges. We can all agree at a high level that we share a commitment to, say, safety and science-based rules. But the problem is that science and data do not always generate clear-cut answers, and that's where leadership is important. No progress at a multilateral table has ever occurred without, first and foremost, leadership at the bilateral and individual level. The pandemic, as I wrote for the Mercatus Center back in March, the pandemic urgently increases the need for governments to digitize, sanitize, and liberalize supply chains so that goods and agriculture can continue to cross borders safely around the planet so that suppliers can continue to receive revenue. The WTO and various countries are working really hard on these issues. But the answer here is all about standards, not tariffs and quantitative limits on trade. So one of the refreshing things about the report is that while it provides a really solid perspective regarding the innovation frontier, and that includes blockchain, that includes the Internet of Things, it throws off more data than most of us can imagine. The report also remembers that trade in goods is not going to disappear, no matter how digital an economy we become. It provides analysis and recommendations relevant both to standards regarding digital issues like algorithms and 5G and data privacy, as well as standards associated with physical issues like automobile parts. I can't tell you the report answers all these difficult questions. What I can tell you is that the report is necessary reading for anyone who cares about these issues. It provides a concrete, pragmatic foundation and suggestions for how to deal with them, how to think about it. It advances the ball. So now I will hand off to my friend Bart, who will provide perspective on the report's core recommendations and findings. Over to you, Bart. Okay. 
Okay, so pretty, is that fine? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Barbara. And um, I just want to thank at the outset, um, Freddie at the at the embassy who, you know, he and I met for for tea um, at the outset of this and, and, and decided about this, this, uh, this content and um, had a plan and, and it's, it's great to see it uh, come, come to fruition. And I want to thank uh, Josh and Ole and others at the team <laughs> for, uh, for making it happen. Uh, so uh, Barbara, just to pick on, on, on what you just said, I think that one of the key things um, that we found is if data is super important and who holds the data, who controls the data, who analyzes the data, that's uh, you know a, a critical thing going forward. And you will see this uh, obviously in global headlines at the moment um, where you know, the, there's concern in the US about the Chinese uh, who, you know, have access to certain data. There are similar concerns in Europe about who has access to certain data. And um, I think, you know, one of the conclusions we draw is there's going to be regional regional value chain, uh, chains. And um, it's important to recognize who's in control of those, who's, uh, who's governing those, and uh, who sets the rules? Um, and uh, it, it's one of the key, the key conclusions of the report is that uh, you know, we're all going in different directions, um, and we need to figure out who our allies are in a true sense. So um, I, I'd highlight those two things, um, and then uh, yeah. Uh, Perhaps the rain will, will give the British perspective. Great. And now let's turn over to Rain, who will kind of take us back to a UK perspective. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Sabrina. And uh, thanks again to the uh, Atlantic Council um, for bringing us all uh, together. Uh, I am speaking to you, uh, at least on my weekend is, is a lot closer uh, than, than yours. And uh, I've got the evening sun streaming in through uh, my sunny Oxfordshire. I'm about an hour outside uh, London. Um, uh, and I think as others have said um, at, at the CBI, I mean, my main role is really sort of sitting in between business uh, and government and just really uh, speaking to businesses about uh, you know, obviously how they've seen this crisis, how they've uh, survived uh, through it, but but absolutely the importance of, of trade, both to uh, their businesses, um, but, but also to sort of growth uh, in the future. And my background is also around, you know, China and emerging markets and, and trade. In, in fact, I started my career as an economist sort of studying uh, trade in, in services. And I think what's interesting, you know, particularly about this report and thinking about the US and the UK and, and our experiences through uh, this crisis is actually the structure of our economies in some ways are are similar and we're both very reliant uh, on services. And I think that has meant that actually we've seen quite a strong impact, obviously, on our economy, um, you know, through that role of, of services. And, and it's particularly true for, for the UK. Um, you know, it's so much of services relies on on people meeting face to face um, or uh, even though digital technology is transforming that. So it has meant that the UK has been more affected through this crisis. But I do, um, you know, as was being set as is set out in the report and uh, and um, as Joss was setting out at, at the beginning of, of this webinar, uh, you know, the future of trade is absolutely about services. I mean, for the UK, over half of our trade outside of the EU is in services already. And if you look globally over the future, it's growth in services trade that that will really drive, um, you know, future trade. And I think there's, uh, and particularly globally, when you think about, uh, you know, the rising middle class in Asia, and that's you know, we obviously see that in China, but this is also a story about India. It's a story about so many other, the, 
the other countries in in Southeast Asia. And what we're seeing there is, you know, um, uh, people who are looking for services, they're looking for financial services. How do you save uh, for your old age? What about media education? Um, uh, you know, high value manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, and so many things where services play such a big uh, a big component. So even though services may have led, you know, maybe having a tougher time uh, at the moment as as we're dealing in a world uh, where COVID is still very much among us, I think over the long term, uh, it will be services that actually drive some of the engine uh, of growth globally. And, and I do think uh, this report makes a really important uh, contribution uh, in that. Um, and I think the, you know, just to pick up on a few things people have already said, really agree with what Barbara is saying, that the thing about sort of trading and services is it's all about, you know, recognition of standards, regulations, qualifications is such an important part of uh, how countries trade uh, in, in services. And it it's absolutely also linked to, you know, ultimately uh, to people, um, and, and as we've seen in, in this crisis, that's certainly uh, been, been the case. And I think going forward, there's such an opportunity, particularly when we're thinking about US, UK trade, about what we could do around mutual recognition of, of qualifications, because that is so much about, you know, uh, looking at the trade and professional services and engineers and uh, legal advice in financial services, it's it's recognizing people who are, are experts and having that mutual recognition of, of qualifications really leads, um, I think, to uh, both countries and, and ultimately globally grasping some of the opportunities uh, that are there. And I think the other thing I would absolutely say as well is actually, and I think some others have sort of drawn this out, is uh, I think particularly as economists in, in the past, we used to think about you know, manufactured goods on the one side and services as being something very discreet on the other side. But I, I think that is so outdated and it is absolutely a changing world of technology that is driving that. It's it's automation, it's AI, it's the internet of things. And when I talk to businesses now, you know, car manufacturers don't see themselves necessarily as producing goods. They are uh, produ often producing mobility as a service and that's what they're um, seeing so they're thinking about not only about how you get from A to B uh, in a car what that car looks like but they're thinking about how does that car get serviced and the, the data that is required as part of that what media uh, might you be experiencing while you're in that car particularly if you think about um, driverless cars and there's so many other examples in the airline industry and in construction so much of what we're seeing now is that goods have have services embedded in them um as part of uh, this this revolution i think uh, we're seeing and i think that will become uh, more and more important uh as, as we move forward um so i think you know if anything this this and, and finally i suppose i'll say a few words about sort of resilience in in supply chains because i think one of the you know the real questions everyone's been asking themselves is you know what we've seen you know trade has has led to you know this this pandemic spreading uh throughout the world but i think we have to remember that's been the case you know for many centuries uh centuries now um and there's been such huge benefits i think uh to individual countries but also to the world through um through trade um and as we've uh and actually you know some people have said oh well has this led to you know the businesses I talk to in the UK thinking, will they try and source some of their manufacturing goods only uh, from the UK? But of course, what the pandemic has shown us is that, you know, at one point, 70 percent of the world economy uh, was in lockdown. So and that included 70 percent of manufacturing in in the UK. So, uh, you know, it wouldn't have helped you to have onshored that production in the UK. And what most businesses are saying is, yes, they're looking at resilience in their supply chain. They're looking at di diversification, um, but it isn't actually necessarily driving uh, a trend uh, to reshoring. And actually, in some ways, what we're seeing is the opposite because of digital technology. And, and it really has fast tracked, as we're seeing now, um, the adoption of, of digital technologies. It's sort of opening up 
possibilities about how we think about how we trade uh, in services and um, that maybe actually it will rely a bit less on people traveling uh, to deliver some of those services, but digital technologies will enable uh, that delivery. Um, but I think ultimately, I suppose, just to echo what, what people have been saying, I think we do need to have uh, international coordination to, to really enable um, some of this trade. Uh, and whether it's bilateral agreements or multi, multilateral, that really is the way uh, forward to, to adapt to a, a changing world uh, of technology and really for us all to, to sort of grasp the opportunities that are out there. So really keen to, to hear some of your questions and thoughts and, and, and reflections. And I'm only sad I couldn't be in, uh, in DC uh, where I think most of you are uh, to enjoy uh, uh, a Friday afternoon. Thank you all for your opening statements. And to your point, Rain, that, that's been something I've looked at in the past few months of, you know, here in Washington, and especially on Capitol Hill, there's been such a conversation of what does reshoring look like and what is bringing manufacturing back and what is bringing companies back to the United States uh, when the reality is that that's not going to happen. And the reality is that, you know, in Washington, they haven't been able to kind of rally around a certain proposal because the fact is that, you know, when it comes to global trade, you're not, you're not gonna bring back supply chains to the United States. Um, but yeah, so I mean, something that I think all of you have echoed is this concept of, you know, international cooperation and how necessary it is. Uh, what does that look like? You know, you, you mentioned, Rain, just now, you know, bilaterals or multilateral agreements, uh, you know, Consul General Philipson mentioned, you know, the WTO, what is the role there? So I'm curious for all of you, your take on, you know, how do we get this done? Where does international cooperation take place? Um, Sabrina, do you want me to kick off and then over you to You can, <laughs> whoever wants to jump in first. <laughs> um, I mean, let, I'll just say a, a few words and, and then over, over um, uh, to others. So I think it's been picked up uh, before. I mean, I think in uh, in the UK and certainly businesses uh, see the value of, of the role of multilateral institutions. I think the WTO, I think a lot of people recognize needs, needs to be uh, reformed. Um, uh, and I think from uh, the businesses I've been speaking to, you know, they want to see that that reform. I think wherever you are, there will be, you know, trade disputes and you need to have a way of resolving them. And, and often a, a multilateral way can uh, can certainly uh, pay, pay dividends uh, uh, within that. Um, but I think we have seen. Uh, you know, we've we've moved, I suppose, in, into a world where we are seeing more bilateral uh, trade agreements as well as multilateral. And I, I, to my mind, I think both can absolutely uh, uh, play a role. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, of course, from the UK's point of view, you know, we want to see a deal uh, with the EU, and, and we hope that uh, will also lead as well to to a deal with uh, the US and, and other countries uh, over over time. But I think, it, you know, it's these discussions that really sort of uh, move for move us all forward and, and grasp some of the opportunities that are out there. So I can uh, that as well. Um, so the the reality is is that if you look into the negotiating history of any one of the major international agreements of our day, whether those are formal international organizations like the WTO or informal ones like the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And I've seen this both from an academic perspective and then from a professional perspective. For many, many years, I was involved in a lot of those activities, particularly with the Basel Committee. Um, there is no clear-cut answer. The, the easiest way to think about it is that no multilateral system moves forward without leadership from countries that band together and provide new ideas and, um, and, and then create a political process, generate allies, generate momentum, move forward. So one country by itself probably can't do very much to advance the ball in a multilateral setting. And the bigger the multilateral setting, the harder the challenge. But countries working together can actually generate forward momentum and advance the ball. There's a third component that is crucially important that often is forgotten in this universe, it, and that's the role of the private sector. 
you know, the, the rules are going to impact commerce. And people on the ground, whether they are small companies, medium-sized companies, large companies, they have views. They are a critical part of the process. And so this is a, a multidimensional challenge which requires a multidimensional solution. And so my experience and my academic research shows that it's not one or the other. You've got to have it all together. All, everyone needs to pitch in and agree to move forward in, in order to make things better for everyone. Yeah, Sabrina, if I, if I could, um, just to add to that, what I'm observing is that a lot of governments, uh, especially the big, the big governments in the EU, are postponing decisions to January um, and, and waiting for the U.S. elections to, to make their next move. And I think that that's logical. Um, in the background, I think Brexit is going to be with us for a while. I, I don't think there'll be an agreement. I, I think there'll be band-aids and, and things that keep moving trade the way it is currently uh, for quite a while. It's, it's like a, Brexit is a, a perennial disappointment um, and will we'll be like that for, for a few years to come. Um, so with that as a background, I, I think, um, you know, world leaders, policymakers are waiting um, to see what happens in the U.S. in the election and to see what kind of U.S. government they're dealing with um, until they tackle big issues like WTO reform. I, I want to jump in and say, uh, just reminder, if you have any questions that you want to pose for the panelists, uh, now is a great time to start inputting them before the end of the panel. Um, and with Bart's words, I'm going to turn it to Anthony because he just called Brexit a perennial disappointment. <laughs> um, and I'm curious to to get your take though on you know where the UK wants to play a role on this and where you think there's opportunities. I mean, right now is obviously a time of many negotiations going on simultaneously. Uh, and yeah, and what is the role that the UK could could play on this front? Um, I mean, thanks very much. I mean, Bart will not expect me to agree with his characterization of Brexit. Um, you know, <laughs> Brexit, Brexit is a process, and actually, in one sense, Brexit is is not the process we're in now. We left the EU on the 31st of January. What we are now involved in is fixing our future relationship uh, with uh, the EU, and that will play out in the existing negotiation. And actually, I personally believe it will play out um, whatever happens in this negotiation over the coming years, because this is a highly dynamic uh, context, as we've all touched on. I mean. If I can sort of almost flip back around to the, the question, I mean, my take on this as, as you know, sort of policymaker is we need to look for where we have organisations that can make the rules and set the standards in these areas. Um, and there'll be various. And I think, for example, at a national level, I think the, the, what the UK has done on things like the, uh, the regulatory sandbox for fintech, uh, I think, has been a really fundamental part of why we are, I would say, the world's leading location for fintech uh, investment uh, at the minute. Um, then there's the bilaterals. I've touched on the UK-US. Obviously, UK-EU is a sort of bilateral. There's two parties to it, but it's pretty plurilateral in terms of sort of the party on the other side of the table. Um, but there's also you know, the UK next year, uh, if I mentioned this earlier, forgive me, we will chair the G7 as well as the COP. And I think the G7 is a place where we should be having some of these conversations, not necessarily about setting the frameworks, but identifying the issues that need to be addressed and can then be handed off to other organisations like the OECD, like the Basel uh, sort of structures, the Financial Stability Board. And then the key thing, in my view, is where there are gaps, where do we create them? So where are we going to have a plurilateral discussion about uh, artificial intelligence? I very much believe that we can take what we are doing nationally uh, through the Center for Data Ethics that I mentioned, working with the US uh, about what they're doing, and then we can work out where we can, uh, where we can discuss them. The other point I'll just make, sort of flipping it around again, is um, the point made earlier, which I really, really agree with about the importance of things like the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which, of course, is not a new topic. I mean, this is we've been talking about this for a while here in the US. We do a lot of work at state level because that's where a lot of those uh, those qualifications are recognized. You can have a qualification to to be an architect in Massachusetts. It doesn't give you the right to be an architect in New York. Uh, it's not a single market. So 
you know, we need to almost go subnational as well as national, bilateral, plurilateral, multilateral. And I think the fundamental point is we have to be clear about the issues we're trying to address, which is why this report is so important as a contribution to that discussion, and then be pragmatic uh, about where we do so. Thanks. Does anyone else want to jump in? I know, Rain, maybe you want to add on, on just the state of, you know, UK negotiations with uh, with the world. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say multiple, not just the US. Um, well, I guess I just really uh, agree with Anthony about, you know, Brexit is, is, is a process, not, not an end destination. You know, we have, we've left, we politically left the European Union and now we're in, uh, you know, trade negotiations and, you know, I'm certainly hopeful we'll have a shape of a, a deal by, by the end of, of the year. But I think, you know, trade is never static as well. So wherever we end up that, you know, we will be, um, there will be future uh, negotiations. So, um, you know, and I think that's important to, to remember. And, um, you know, and, and equally, we hope we'll continue to be uh, with the US that they're, you know, will reach, uh, you know, more of a deal, but we already have many arrangements uh, with the US. Um, and I think particularly around services, you know, so much of how you trade in services is actually around trade facilitation uh, agreement. So I, I do think sometimes we, we can get fixed on, have, you know, one trading uh, agreement or one one set of negotiations but but in reality you know particularly larger economies are almost in in sort of a constant period of, of negotiations and sometimes it is that you know mutual recognition of rules and qualifications can can make a real difference to how you open up uh you know different sectors uh to to trade um i'm happy to pick up on some of the questions in in the chats around uh, as an economist i can't resist uh questions around uh inflation and <laughs> well, I'll I will pose that one uh, for everyone now. Then, so you know, uh, we have: Do you see negative interest rates ahead for the U.S. and any thoughts on global deflation? Thank you. Well, I probably and, and I should say I might I might leave it to some of the U.S. commentators to, to talk about the Fed action uh, in particular, but I guess. Um, can talk a little bit about, you know, the outlook in the UK and, and sort of more globally. And what, what's interesting is actually I often, I get asked as often about deflation, about inflation at the moment as I do about deflation. So maybe that's a, a sort of indicator that 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 um, we're, we're actually quite balanced in terms of our, our monetary uh, policy path. But I think, yes, more... More generally, I think we'll continue to be in this world of low real interest rates for a long period of time. There were lots of structural reasons uh, that we were where we were in that um, you know in that period uh, before this pandemic hit us, and it's partly around aging and demographics and uh, and other factors. Um, uh, and so as yeah, as I sort of look ahead, I mean, obviously, we've seen, you know, all prices at, at low levels. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're seeing currently low levels of uh, inflation. Um, uh, and I think, but I think what's been interesting about this crisis, right, is yes, it's absolutely hit uh, demand, but it's also hit uh, supply. So, um, and I think going forward, there's still concerns about supply shortages that could lead to, to pockets of uh, in inflation. So, um, yeah, I, I think on the list of things that keep me up at night, global deflation at the moment is probably not in my top five. I think those other, you know, the biggest issue, I guess, you know, certainly the US, definitely in the UK that we're very worried about, apart from, you know, inf rising infection rates and, uh, and how the health crisis plays out is the impact on unemployment. I think that's uh, the primary uh, concern for economic policy makers uh, where we are now. Okay, and I, I want to get to some of the other questions. We have more coming in at the moment, which is great. Um, and keep them coming, please. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put out Nick Davies's question. Does the panel agree we need a new Bretton Woods consensus around the future of money, and that the US UK might usefully cooperate to supply the global leadership needed to make that a reality and a success? Oh, what a fabulous and difficult question. <laughs> um, so I'm, I have done quite a bit of research on the, 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 the Bretton Woods Agreement, and I'm, member, I'm a member of the Bretton Woods Committee. So what I can tell you is I, I'm not really sure that um, that's the right paradigm 
for the, the digital currency space. I've been writing about this as well um, at the Council and elsewhere. And the reason why I don't think it's the right paradigm is that the Bretton Woods construct itself was very unique to a very specific post-war situation. And technically, in many ways, the, much of the Bretton Woods consensus kind of ended with the gold standard and we ended up with something else. It's really kind of a halfway house. Um, the second reason why I don't think that the Bretton Woods construct is a good place to start is that um, in the digital currency space, there are profound sovereignty issues there. Uh, and not only are there profound sovereignty issues as every central bank, and I, and I do mean every central bank, including the Federal Reserve, including the Banque de France, including the ECB, BOJ, all of the big boys, as well as a number of, of very important players in Malaysia and Singapore, obviously China. Um, you know, they view this as part of their sovereign responsibility to their economies. And so I'm not really sure that a multilateral structure, a multilateral kind of table like Bretton Woods provided is, is going to be useful. And then finally, the third reason is in the digital currency space, I mean, for the first time in centuries, sovereigns have real competition on the currency side. Blockchain makes that possible. Domestic, individual, private sector issuers potentially can generate sufficient scale in the payment system to serve as an alternative medium of exchange. And Bretton Woods, of course, did not have any private sector people present at the table. So there are plenty of reasons why structurally I think Bretton Woods is probably not the, 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 the best paradigm. I do know um, the central banks through the BIS Innovation Hub jointly and then individually, the Bank of England has been amazing in its outreach to the private sector, its contributions with webinars and speeches and thought leadership has been very much at the forefront of this entire debate from the beginning. Others were slower to the party. So I think this is going to be a domestic, national, and, um, and private sector engagement that you know, I mean, if you think about the blockchain and the, the distributed nature of the way transactions are executed, I mean, we live in a distributed age, and I've written about that as well. The distributed age really is allergic to centralized solutions. So I'm not, while, while there are plenty of things about the Bretton Woods structure and discussions that I think are valuable for us even today, this is not a space I personally believe is amenable to that model. Okay. Um, I want to make sure we get to all the questions before the time wraps up. So uh, I'm going to pose the question from Noelle Cuhane from BDO and European Services Forum. Does the panel, do the panel see uh, the trade and services agreement being brought back to the table to foster multilateral slash plurilateral trade in services liberalization, especially if Biden is elected in November? Who should I throw it to? Is Rain or Bart? Does Bart want to jump in? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so th the short answer is no. Um, I don't see productive and constructive uh, trade negotiations happening uh, in the remain in the reign of the Trump administration or in a new Biden administration if it happens. Um, I, I don't think this is the moment for ambitious. EU, US trade talks. Uh, I just don't think we're there. Um, and there may be progress on limited things like, uh, I don't know, uh, regulation of insurance companies or something else boring that doesn't really, you know, get the farmers and, and friends riled up. Um, but I, I, I don't think this is a time for ambitious trade agreements. And I, I, I think we're not there for another five or 10 years. Does anyone co-sign that or disagree? Um, I mean, I think I, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, I think the point I would keep coming back to is, um, you know, we are certainly support, we would be supportive of TISA coming back. Uh, we think that, you know, having a multilateral discussion about liberalizing trade and services uh, would be a positive. Um, 
I think the WTO probably has some other priorities uh, just at the minute in terms of uh, the reform agenda, especially on the dispute settlement side. But that doesn't mean that we can't also try and address some of the uh, uh, difficulties it's had on the rulemaking side. Uh, I guess the point I would make is that I don't think it's the only way to address the issue. Um, you know, if TISA comes back, then great. Maybe if we can get some bilateral conversations going between the UK and the US, UK and the EU, uh, I don't necessarily disagree with Bart's um, characterization of you know his lack of optimism about meaningful progress on the US EU side. But actually, you know, we are seeing talks between the US and the EU. Now, maybe trading off main lobster tariffs for for lighters is is not earth shattering in a sense, but it shows that there are talks going on. So I think it's a question of sort of finding progress where we can make it. And if that then turns into momentum that you could then see as being reinvigorating progress on TISA, that would be a good thing. Um, but if it remains blocked, then we have to find somewhere else to have the conversation. Okay. So uh, I think all... this next... Oh, go agree... ahead, Barbara. Let me agree with Bart that um, the election is not going to change the political dynamic around trade in the United States. There's a... People don't talk about it as a bipartisan consensus, but it is a bipartisan consensus that is profoundly hostile to uh, much of what those of us on this call like to think of as the challenging uh, dynamic, which is a good one of international trade. Having said that, um, I'm not sure progress is impossible. Services will continue to be the core driver of economic growth for advanced economies particularly the United States and the UK, <coughs> can change. And the political constellation of resistance to cross-border trade tends not as much to be with respect to services. So I, I, for the same reason that I agree with Bart about the prognosis, I would suggest that regardless of who is in the White House, the economic argument in favor of more service trade is going to place pressure on whoever is in the White House to become more constructive and, um, and, and craft a new compromise. Uh, and, but having said that, like most people involved in trade, I am a perpetual optimist, and I look at the opportunity as for, for incremental progress. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to, we, we have a short amount of time left and I definitely want to get through these questions. Uh, I think this one's going to go to Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner and uh, it's from Doug Palmer, who I'm going to say is my favorite coworker uh, ever. Uh, so Doug is asking, how much progress has been made on digital issues and talks with the U.S.? Are there any big sticking points and are there differences between the U.S. and EU approaches to digital trade that could pose a dilemma for the U.K.? Uh, thanks very much, and thanks, Doug. Nice to uh, hear from you indirectly. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think I would say that we are making good progress within the UK-US uh, talks on digital, and it is a priority for both sides to use this agreement to try and uh, establish gold standard of, uh, of, co of collaboration between us that we can then take into other fora, as I've talked about uh, a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I think we are we are exchanging texts, and uh, I have, must say I haven't had a readout from. Uh, the end of the fourth round, uh, which is wrapping up today, and uh, I hope to get more, and uh, we can always come back to this next week. Um, I think the US-EU piece, I mean, uh, I think I have always felt that there is a challenge for the UK here in terms of as we establish a sort of digital trade relationship and a data relationship, which I completely agree with everyone who said how fundamental that is to almost everything we've been talking about. I mean, it is sort of the 21st century version of oil uh, in terms of sort of facilitating uh, global commerce. Um, you know, so the UK is needing to fix its relationship with the EU uh, as part of those talks. Uh, we are looking to establish new standards with the US. At the same time, of course, the US and the EU uh, are going back through some fairly familiar issues uh, in the light of the latest Schrems ruling. Um, and, you know, how the UK, I've always felt there is an opportunity here for the UK to try and sort of see if it can establish uh, or establish a position that the other two could coalesce around. Uh, but it clearly, you know, the ideal for us to be, it would be in a world where the, all three parts of that triangle uh, sort of line up in a way that facilitates the flow of data, has due respect to consumers' privacy concerns, uh, etc. What that exactly looks like, um, I don't yet know, but that's, I think, the, uh, the conversation that we're having at the minute. Thanks. Okay, and I'm going to turn over to the last question, just so everyone has time to give some brief closing statements. Um, the last question we're going to hit at here is, 
When we look at trade and investment flows, there has been a significant body of work done on industrial subsidies for goods. Should we also be looking at industrial subsidies on services, which is currently not covered under any trade rules? Another excellent question. <laughs> um, so at the sectoral, so I, I, the bottom line is I think the answer is yes. The better, uh, but the way I think about it is not do you want to attack it head on. There's a, a robust discussion underway right now internationally on um, industrial subsidies in general around state-owned enterprises upon which actually there's a lot of agreement within Europe and the United States on, um, on the need to tighten up state-owned enterprises. And I think tackling it that way can um, generate a lot of benefits for uh, companies that are currently adversely impacted by state subsidies in the services sector, particularly when it comes to transportation and delivery services. So um, engaging in that space, um, I, I think, provides some indirect benefit. Um, attacking it directly, um, I probably would feel differently about it if I thought the WTO was functioning at the moment, but I don't think it is. And so I'm not sure that it's a great space to move forward. So it m m tactically, my suggestion would be maybe to try to focus on individual bilateral discussions and, and make some progress with individual countries um, uh, beyond the, the state-owned enterprise. And, and the elephant in that room, of course, is China. Uh, so uh, this is, a, a, again, a multilateral, multidimensional problem that requires a multidimensional response. Is there anyone else that wants to put in a comment before we go to closing statements? Okay, great. Uh, I, I want to tie in kind of the closing statement with one of the last questions we've received that I think is perfect is, you know, with respect to trade in the global economy, what are your top concerns that keep you up at night? <laughs> um, and yeah, if, uh, you know, we have only a couple minutes left, so if we can kind of move along on it, but uh, I will, you know, I on my screen, the first person I see is Rain, so we want to go through. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. I'm, I'm glad you chose that question because I was shamelessly going to choose that. Uh, to to <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, I think what keeps me up at, at night, it, it's, you know, how we tackle this pandemic. And, you know, here in the UK, where it's particularly rising infection rates and um, challenges with, understandably, with capacity around testing systems. Uh, and not just what that means for health, but the wider economy and also, you know, aviation within that. And um, uh, because whether it's thinking about goods or, or people, how we move around, you know, it's so important. We need we need a global testing and tracing uh, system that works effectively for us to, to have confidence. And, and certainly let's hope. Uh, there is a vaccine as soon as possible. One of my neighbors literally over there uh, is working at the Jenner uh, Institute on the, on the uh, vaccine. So let's hope for that. I think a second real concern is about rising uh, unemployment. You know, if we don't get this, you know, the sort of second wave of measures to support the economy right, we could see rising unemployment in the UK. And uh, obviously it's already relatively high in, in the US. Uh, and if that leads to, you know, understand you know that that's a real concern in itself and what that means for households and particularly young people but if that then you know it's very easy to use trade as something to blame um and and i guess if that leads to a you know another wave of, of i guess anti-trade sentiment i think that's a real uh concern uh for all of us it would probably be remiss of me not to say that look uh, a no deal Brexit, I think, would be a huge challenge uh, for the UK, certainly talking uh, to businesses. They're very worried about facing that at the same time um, that we are all focused on on tackling uh, the pandemic and, and supporting the economy uh, through that. So, so let's hope we get a deal uh, before the end of the year. Okay, and Bart, over to you. Yeah, um, well, just to start on Brexit, I'm, uh, I'm particularly negative on, uh, there's not going to be a Brexit. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, 
what they'll end up agreeing to is, you know, kicking, kicking the can down the road. Um, and so it'll be disappointing for everybody, uh, including the people who voted for Brexit. Um, and uh, trade relationships and economic relationships with the, between the EU, be, between mainland Europe and the UK will be roughly as they were. And uh, the UK will take the rules. Um, and I think that's inevitably where it's going to be for for another couple of years. Um, and it's it's perfect for the Johnson government because it allows kind of festering of this issue. Um, and and it's, it's good for populists. Uh, but that's that's where that is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I know it's provocative at the last minute, but that's where I think that is. Okay, and then Barbara, over to you. Um, well, so what keeps me up at night um, actually relates to my day job. So my day job, I'm a founder and CEO of, it, of a, a company at the Frontier Innovation Alternative Data. And I worry greatly about competition in data, um, data localization, um, and a conflict on data privacy standards. I think you know, the most people don't appreciate how big the data market is. And not only how big it is, but how, um, how much it relies on the cross-border flow of information. And the prospect of not being able to have data cross borders, whether that's in the banking business, whether that's in the transportation delivery business, whether that is, in my space, alternative data, um, the inability to have data cross borders, and I don't mean personally identifiable data, I mean just wholesale industrial data, um, is going to, if it goes the direction we're going in right now, people won't be able to make good decisions because they won't have as much information at their fingertips 20 years on down the road they do today, or it will be more expensive to do. And I don't think that there's enough work done on this. And Anthony, last but not least. Um, so, uh, I mean, we probably need a separate panel to talk about Bart's comments, so I might reserve for, for that. Although I noted that my foreign secretary was speaking on an Atlantic Council panel yesterday, so um, uh, I think people can probably go and find the transcript of that for, uh, for the UK government view. Um, I don't disagree with anything others have said about what keeps them awake at night. Uh, I think that you know, some of it, in my mind, comes together around how do we recreate a sense of shared purpose, a sense of uh, restoring public trust in in governance. Uh, you know, I think we've we've unpacked some of those issues. Uh, I guess the only other one I would add uh, actually is is the climate agenda. Um, I think you know we are not keeping track with what we have said we needed to do at various climate summits over the last twenty years, twenty plus years since Kyoto. So, uh, we live in a world where I think it's just undeniable that climate is is having an impact uh, on the world that we're living in, whether it's the number of hurricanes coming through the Atlantic or wildfires on the west coast of the US uh, or indeed the east coast of Australia. So, you know, I think this is, this is a climate uh, emergency and, you know, I think the work that we will do in partnership, again, this point about global collaboration, uh, enhanced by technology in terms of some of the solutions around uh, mitigation, adaptation, transition to a low carbon economy, et cetera, uh, fundamentally important. And just along with dealing with the pandemic, dealing with sense of global opportunity and global creation of economic security and opportunity uh, in all nations is just uh, that's probably what gets me awake at four o'clock in the morning there's a lot it's a long list for all of us i think uh, i would love for us to, to stop, check back <laughs> <laughs> right i hope we can all check back in after the pandemic and hopefully have a rosier outlook um but on that note, I, I want to thank the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center for hosting this, uh, the panelists for taking the time to join us, and the audience. I really, um, I'm really glad that you know we got a great flow of questions going. I think this conversation was great and much needed. Uh, so I hope everyone has a great Friday, and thanks again for tuning in. All right, thanks thank very much. much. Bye.